Don't you know that you've been so good to me? And I know that I can't do it by myself. I need your love so desperately. It's been times I wanted to give up, but your words they spoke to me. Feel my spirit, help me to believe, but sometimes I still get weak. I need you to fill me up, fill me up. I know you know my flaws. Your love fills up every empty part of me that was hiding for so long. The love of my life now I've evolved. I wanna be what you want, and by your strength I'll break down every wall. of world history according to the bible i'm shamar yah and to my left yah tazar yah and tonight we are going over adam and eve um i, I don't think well i'll just keep it simple i don't think this is going to be the uh the same old they were the first people and the apple and all that kind of stuff but i also want to focus on the dynamic of the relationship <laughs> Uh, specifically, you know, their interactions, what happened, and, and the importance of them partaking of that fruit. So let's start off with Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And Yahweh said, let us make man in our image uh -huh. after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It said, let us make man in our image. Our. And it says, let them have dominion over the fish. So the man was going to be above all the other animals, mammals, whatever, what have you, on the earth. Right? Go ahead. So the most high created man in his own image. And the image of the most high created he him. Male and female created he them. Read on. And the Most High blessed them. The Most High said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Uh -huh. And the Most High said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for me. Let's drop down to chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. And the, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breath into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. 
Go ahead. And the Most High planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Mm -hmm. The name of the first is Pison. That is which compasseth the whole land of Havilah where there is gold mm -hmm. and the gold of that land is good there is a uh, dilium and the uh, onyx stone and the name of the second river is gaihan the same is that compasses the whole land of ethiopia yeah. and the name of the third <laughs> river is hitix uh hitic hitic mm -hmm. that is which goeth toward the east of assyria and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep and to keep it. Okay, so it was a lot that happened, right? So Adam gets created. He gets dominion over all the animals, right? Um, and I always think about that when it says dominion over all the animals. That's why humans have been able to, you know, first and foremost, when you come up on animals, what's the first thing they do? Most of the time they panic, right? they're either gonna run, or if they're a very large or carnivore animal, they're gonna freak out and fight. And they're gonna think that more than likely you pose a threat. Just like, you know, if you're dealing with a bear, a bear is very powerful, it should be able to kill you easily, right? If you get around the cubs, it's gonna consider you, consider you so much of a threat that it's going to feel the, new, the need to kill you so that you can't harm its young. Why would an animal that massive and that strong that will fight other eight foot, 500 pound bears be afraid of a, 5, 10, 185 pound man, because we have dominion over all the animals. You jump in the water, the fish scatter. Not just because of the noise and the shock, but also because they see humans. They're aware of that, right? We have dominion, but it goes further than that. That's why a lot of animals have been domesticated. Even when you take lions and you got them in the circus and you got that man cracking a whip, he controlling the lion. Now, yeah, you see the, the, the examples of the times where it goes bad, the lion gets, man, I bet I could take him. But you see that dominion going far more often. Even, I, man, I was watching videos of Mike Tyson. He had tigers playing with them like dogs, you know, playing with them and boxing them, slapping them around, playing basketball. We have dominion over all the earth. And Adam had a, like a sweet deal. It was a river that went through the Garden of Eden that split into four heads. Everything was kept up. Everything was naturally, uh, what do you call that, irrigated. Adam was put in that garden to dress and to keep it. Go ahead. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, uh -huh. but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So the Most High said, Look, everything that's out here, you get to enjoy it. You get to partake of it. You can eat of it. But this tree that's of the knowledge of good and evil, that's the only tree that's off limits. Right. He said, and if you eat of it, then you're going to die. Now, that doesn't mean that as soon as he take a bite, it's instantly just lights off. No. But he said, if you eat of that, trust me, you're going to die. Right. Go ahead. And the Lord, our power said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And, and that's what the focus of this lesson is going to be, specifically the dynamic of Adam and Eve. So the Most High was looking at Adam. He said, man, it's, not, it's really not good for him to be alone. Yeah, he has dominion over all the animals. You know, maybe Adam befriended some animals. I always, you know, you see that, what's that movie, Dr. Doolittle? You know, he kind of yeah. had dominion over all the animals. I think in that movie he could talk to them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that was the case. But, you know, you see him being able to have dominion over all the animals, being able to have a certain type of relationship with all the animals. But the Most High was saying, well, it's really not good for man to be alone. And that's why you see so many people, especially brothers and men, that fall apart in prison because it's isolation, right? You're in, a, you're in a cell 23 hours out of the day. You only have a little bit of time, a free time to be out on the yard. You got to watch your shoulder. And then as a punishment, what happens? You get even more taken from you. And then you get put in uh, isolation, right? You get put in the hole. 
that's even more of a punishment because it's not normal and it's not good for a man to be alone. That lack of interaction, that lack of conversation, that lack of stimulation, it can drive the mind to do it to be irrational. You know, there's even um, scientific and psychological experiments that have been conducted where people are put in sensory deprivation rooms, not just the chamber, but the entire room. And they're kept there for long periods of time. A room filled with completely white with almost no stimulation causes the brain to basically drift off. It causes the brain to basically start to, uh, to imagine and to hallucinate. And there are even people who, there have been you know, experiments conducted where people were given the option of shocking themselves. And it, I, you know, this is going more so um, into being alone, but they were given the option to shock themselves when they were extremely bored. And some people were choosing to shock themselves because they're looking for some level of stimulation. So the most High was like, uh, I already know my creation. I could look at Adam without all these things having happened yet because he knows the beginning and the end. He said, it's really not good for man to be alone. Go ahead. Verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Uh -huh. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meet form. So Adam is presented with every animal that exists, right? Every animal is brought to him and he said, what do you want to call this one? Uh, I'm going to call that one a lion. Oh, okay, cool. What do you want to call this one? Penguin. <laughs> okay. What do you want to call this one? Parrot. Whatever the names were at that time, you know, things may have changed through language, but whatever it was that Adam was given those names, or excuse me, whatever animal that he was given that name, that was the name of that animal. But it said, but with all that he was doing, there was no help for him. Go ahead. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of men. So the most high, and that's why you, you hear a lot of brothers call their wives, oh, this is my rib. Because Eve was created for Adam out of Adam, right? So when you're saying this is my rib, he said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She's a part of me now. That's a very important thing. I feel like a lot of people don't really look at marriage for what it is. You know, people say their vows, especially in a world you have a, this nice marriage is orchestrated by a pastor in sickness and in health. Man, I don't think a lot of people take that into consideration. We so busy looking at the physical. Oh, he's so handsome. He got that six pack. I bet he got these things that I would enjoy, y'all know what I'm talking about. She got the things that I would enjoy, y'all know what I'm talking about. She's a beautiful woman. Y'all not considering that you're going to get old together. You might get fat together. It might be one person to get overweight. It might be one person to physically change. It might be some, you know, your, your wife or your husband can get into a car accident, change your life forever, not be able to walk the same. They can't jog like they used to. They putting on weight. They look differently. Now, what did you fall in love with? Did you fall in love with the physical, or did you fall in love for who they are as a person? Because if you fell in love with who are, they are as a person, when they go from 170 to 230, you're still going to love them because you're still having that conversation that you enjoy. You're still seeing that smile that you enjoy. You're still getting to enjoy the person that you actually fell in love with. But if you're not taking those things into consideration and, it, and the love is only surface deep, when things change, so will that love, right? But he said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. But look how important this is. Read verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Uh -huh. And they shall be one flesh. It said he's going to leave his father and his mother. That's who raised him up. That's who, for the most part, made him who he is. Right? You, okay. you get a lot of, uh, of nurturing from your mother. You get a lot of wisdom from your father. They oftentimes really start to make you who you are. That, that's like the, those are the two main factors oftentimes in the development of your early life, your mother and your father. But the Most High said, I'm going to make this woman, and she's going to cause a man to leave his mother and his father, leave that nest, leave that familiarity, to go and build with her, right? And it says, and they too shall become one flesh. What does that mean? Does that mean that when they lie together, they have uh, intercourse, that they're going to literally morph together like the morphin' mm -hmm. twins and become something new? No. It literally means that they're going to become one. 
And oftentimes, the reason why it's so difficult to become one is because you got two entirely different people with two entirely different views clashing. They're not really merging, they're clashing together. And you know, you take two entirely different worlds and two entirely different mentalities and you try to merge them together. It's a rough transition. Some things don't mix, water and oil. You know, uh, if I'm, what is that? Mm, I wanna say metal, no, not metal and wood. Basically, they're just materials that just don't mix, right? There are certain things that just don't combine well. So um. if, if and when you get married, if and when you become one flesh with somebody, it shouldn't just be intercourse and okay, we won. Nah, your mentality's gotta line up. They serious about the commandments? Do they really believe the way that you believe? Are you unequally yoked? Are you making the right decision? Is this person going to follow your mentalities? Better yet, are they going to follow the most high? Because I feel like if, if someone's keeping the commandments, it's really not a whole bunch outside of what's in the law that a man or a woman could expect from their spouse. You have everything that you could think of. You have the, the intimacy. You have the, the rules and regulations. You have the trust. You have the communication. That's all found in the scriptures. You have financial wisdom. All these things are already given to us. But they are supposed to become one flesh, right? Now, either the man is more than likely going to start taking on attributes of the woman or the woman is more than likely going to start taking on attributes of the man. And that's oftentimes where the struggle begins of who is going to come out on top. But we're going to get into that. Read on. Verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Uh -huh. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Uh -huh. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So Eve knew the rules. Go ahead. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And that's the thing. Oftentimes, you know, they say, I've heard idle time is the devil's playground. I also think that um, indecisiveness is his playground. Because Satan only needs to put a little bit of doubt. And I, and I it kind of hit me a little while ago. I said, man, if, you know, Yahweh Shai said that you just have to have the faith of a mustard seed in order to command a mountain to move. So how much doubt does it take to do the opposite? To make you stay still, to make you stuck in place, to make you doubt so much that you're paralyzed. How much does it take? <laughs> probably that mustard seed, right? It probably is the, it, about the same because the scriptures say, look upon the works of the most high. They're two and two. There's balance. Go ahead. Verse five. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So this, the serpent told Eve, this, he's telling her, look, you're not going to die. You think you're going to die if you eat fruit or if you partake of this? You think that you're going to die if you just go out here and, 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 and something small? And it's something simple as that. Oftentimes, that mentality is used in so many different ways. And you know how I really think that this comes into play? When people get told that their, their fringes are spiritual. You think the Most High going to put me to death because I'm not wearing fringes? Well, that is in his law. He said if you offended one, you offended all. <laughs> but there go the serpent yeah. right there. People think it's a snake and an apple. No. It's, it's the mentalities and the doctrines. He said, I see uh, men as trees. You think, you think the most high going, so, so if I got on fringes, but I ain't been keeping the commandments, right, you can come up with all these different doctrines and ideologies and opinions. Yeah. Follow what the most high said. It's, it's going to be that simple. And everything else will already be worked out and everything else is already figured out. Follow uh -huh. the commandments, right? It's that simple. So you think that if you partake, you're going to die? That's what he said. <laughs> and that's all you need to know. Go ahead. But, oh, I'm sorry, one last thing. He said, but he offered Eve, actually, let's read it. Let, go ahead. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. And to make one wise. He said, you'll be as gods. What was Eve really after? He didn't say it's going to make you fly. Right. Oh, my God, I'll be able to fly? What? I've been walking all this time, wasting my time. I can just take off. No, that, that wasn't what, it, what tantalized her. That wasn't what enticed her. He didn't say, this will make you immortal. They were already made to be immortal. They had a lot of the things, or really, they had everything that they needed. But what appealed to Eve? Being wise. Because why? Why would being wise be so important to her? 
Why would being educated be so important to her? And you see the same thing being pushed on our women today, right? You're an independent woman that don't need everything. You educated, you pay your own bills. Well, guess what? But guess who that really means that she doesn't need if she's able to provide on her own? The man. If you educated, you providing your own, you paying your bills, you got the nice Benz, you got the BMW, you don't need a man for nothing. That's what the world teaches now. And why do you think it's so easy for sisters to fall into it? Because your foremother fell into it. Our foremother fell into it. It's the same thing since the beginning. That's what it's really about, power. You partake of this, you'll be different. You're going to be wise. You're going to be strong. You're going to be knowledgeable. You're going to know more than him. <gasps> Read on. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So two questions I have. First and foremost, how long was Adam in the garden by himself? We don't really know, right? The scriptures oh. are bridged, and it doesn't say, and Adam was 500 years old when he partook of the fruit, but we do know that he died at almost 1,000. We don't know how long he was in the garden for. I don't read it. So how long was, was Adam alive in the garden at peace, not partaking of that fruit, Eve gets created, she gives it to him. And also, my question, I wonder how long it took her to get, to, to, to get him to partake. I don't think she just came along and was like, hey, we right. should try this. He's just like, okay. No, nah, I don't think it happened no. like that. But I do see, like, for example, with Samson, strongest man, probably, strongest physically at least to ever live, right? They had to send thousands of men just to go have a conversation with him because they're like, man, if Samson get upset... <coughs> It's going to be a problem. We need to at least take about 3,000. Go talk to him. But guess who Samson's weakness was? Delilah. And she pressed upon him. Tell me your weakness. Like, what? All right, well, you know, if you tie me up with some ropes that ain't never been tied up, I think it was flax that ain't never been used before, I'll lose all my strength. And she tied him up. She like, Samson, the Canaanites are here. I don't know how they got here. Oh, my God. Snap. He got out there and put in work. But surely Samson had to have noticed, oh, my God, she tried to set me up. Right. Why would I tell you my weakness and the day that I do, you tie me up to test it? And then all of a sudden, my ops is outside right at the window uh. with swords. But you see what, what, what Delilah did to Samson? It says she pressed upon him sore, crying, if you loved me, you would tell right. me. You're like, oh, my God, all right. Let's change her. What did he say the second time? He said something the second time. That wasn't it either. Then she got worse than ever. He like, oh, my goodness. Every time, she probably just, <laughs> and you know, a woman got her way to get to a man because they start learning the man. And they can never use that to their advantage in the sense of making them happy and putting them at peace. So they can use that uh, to their advantage to get in his head. She was probably, you know, sitting on the couch. He wake up. She just, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, break down. He like, oh, my God. You already oh know. My God. Yep. How vexing is that? If you've ever had a woman and you dealt with that kind of stuff, how much does that kind of, like, bother you? It just push you a little bit. You'll be at work. It don't matter what you do, how focused you got to be, how long that you got to be there, your mind starts to drift. She got a hold on you, right? So the same thing. So I wonder how long it took Eve to press upon Adam and the things that she was saying and how long. It might have took her 30 years to get him to do it. I don't, it doesn't say a time frame. It just says she came to him and got him to partake. That's, that's, we read that in one verse. How long did it take, though? How long was she pressing upon him and pushing him and come on, do this for me, and you don't know what it's like, and yada, yada, yada. But let's read on. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them both, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Mm. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Uh -huh. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So, so Adam answers the most high. He's like, man, I was naked and I was scared because I heard somebody was coming. So I went and tried to hide. 
And most of I was like, wait, naked? Who told you you was naked? You partook of that fruit, huh? You, you partook of that tree. Go ahead. Verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Let's hold it right there. Get Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. And I hear a whole lot of brothers be like, man, that's a cop out, Adam. Oh, 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 so she made you do something. Now, you're not supposed to give your strength over to a woman, but look how many men have fallen because of that, right? There have been quite a few men. Look at King David. He was a righteous man. He was upright. And the crazy part about it is, because I, when I read these stories, I can't help but think. I can't help but overexamine and o Maybe, maybe not over-examine and over-investigate, but I can't help but to examine and investigate. When King David went out and saw uh, Uriah the Hittite's wife, she was bathing on the roof. First of all, she's bathing on the roof, right? There's no way she's doing that during the day. It was nighttime, and I believe if you read that scripture, uh, it was nighttime. So why is King David up in the middle of the night, being the king, why is he getting up in the middle of the night to go stand on the balcony? He's probably stressed. McCall was such a headache, so terrible and so bad of a woman that even her own daddy was like, man, you are going to be terrible. I know what I could do. Instead of sitting up here having some type of remorse for the way that I raised you, I'm going to use you as a weapon. I'm going to weaponize your maliciousness. I'm going to weaponize your deceit. I'm going to weaponize your manipulation. I'm going to give you over to my enemy. What type of woman is that? How you have a daughter so bad you can weaponize her mannerisms? You're supposed to have raised up a godly woman and say, oh, hold on. Can't everybody just come and get this right here? You know how much time I put into this? How much work I put into this? Nah, it got to be a right. It got to be a righteous man. He got to go through these steps. He got to, you know, I, he got to get through these tests. I might even have to give him some years under my under my my wing and my watch just to be able to prove it like how Jacob did. But Saul, he was like, oh, she's terrible. She's so terrible. I know what I'll do. I'll give her to David. <laughs> My enemy. <laughs> She's so bad. She gone. Oh, I know what she going to do to him. And sure enough, when you see stories like King David in the middle of the night going on to his balcony and then seeing a woman bathing, first and foremost, also another thing. Oftentimes when men become emotional, we're not reasoning the same way. You ever made a decision in a, in a quick moment of, of, of uh, frustration that she was like, damn, why would I do that? Probably because you wasn't thinking. It ain't an excuse for nobody. It ain't an excuse for myself. But I understand what it's like because I've been in those situations now. King David did something that he wasn't reasoning righteously within himself. He's already, look, look at his track record. He fought Goliath. That's like his first thing. That was like the first thing that he did in his legacy of being King David was fought Goliath. But David was overlooked. David was trotting down. He went to Jesse's house. Uh, Samuel the prophet went to Jesse's house. He's like, man, show me your sons. I'm here to pick a king. He's like, oh, check out my firstborn, man. He about 6'7", 250. That boy big. Looking like the people's champion, don't he? He said, nah. Most high told Samuel. He said, nah, that ain't him. I don't see his man seed, Samuel. There's another one. He went through all, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, six of his sons. And he was like, that's all the sons you have? He said, well, there's David. He didn't even regard him. It was time to pick a king. King David wasn't even considered, wasn't even an honorable mention. But look at his track record. Regardless of how men felt about him, look at how he trusted in the Most High. All the army of Israel was scared to go to war. King David like, who, the f who is this? Goliath, so what if he big? He bleed like everybody bleed. He can go down like anybody go down. He had faith in the Most High, and when all the men of war, we're not talking about all the men of Israel, we're specifically talking about the men of men, the men of war, they were all scared and held their peace and was like, I can't do it. King David said, man, let me watch this. Off of, off of faith, off of pure faith. Look at King David's track record. Why would he have done something like commit adultery? I don't think he was thinking. I don't think that he was up in the middle of the night for no reason. I don't think that he was a wicked man. I think he had a moment of weakness. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Proverbs 12 and 26. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. Uh -huh. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, uh -huh. but the way of the wicked seduces them. The, the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. Let's go back to Genesis. The righteous know to maintain themselves. The righteous have the Holy Spirit of discipline. You don't necessarily have to be the most rocked up, super buff man to be disciplined. That's what a lot of people look at. But that's most I said, I'm not seeing as man sees. My thoughts are not your thoughts. 
I don't think that is limited to just being buff. People oftentimes look at the physical, and that's so much of Israel gets caught up on the physical. That's the same issue with the Pharisees. They wanted to look good but not be good. That's a problem in Israel. Everybody, just like uh, when Christ said, uh, you'll, you'll take the, the rich man and you want him to sit in the best seat. You'll tell the poor man to get up because he's looking good. This man probably don't give a damn about you, but he's rich and he looks good, so he's going to have to get the best seats, and i got to give him this certain level of respect. Man, this dude could be wicked as hell. He could be a fornicator. But because he got on gold rings, maybe got a chain on and a fly girl, you're going to give him a good seat like he's somebody. Now, this poor man who probably does keep the commandments, who may not be all super yoked up and buff, who ain't got no gold chains on and probably had to save up to get a ticket, probably had to save up to, to go, go to, uh, to that room or to that show or whatever the case may be, to go to that venue. You the one, you tell, you t- you the one he's the one that you're going to tell to move. Israel be so focused on the physical, but the ways of the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. But the wicked is going to seduce him. You're going to become corrupted eventually, slowly through time, slowly being told something, slowly being shown something, slowly being treated a certain way, it's going to wear out a righteous man to it, where eventually he's going to be seduced by the ways of the wicked. He's going to get seduced. So when, just like with Delilah, just like with McCall and David, well, I won't say Delilah because Samson did it. Well, I'm not going to. But I'll say with King David, I'll use him as a, he's a better example. Well, he had a wicked wife, right? Even King Solomon. King Solomon was doing good. King Solomon was a wise man. He started off with a good heart. He was a young, young king. He was like, man, he said, if all the, uh, w- you know, he started praying to the most high. He said, just give me wisdom so I can be a righteous judge unto your people. He said, man, Solomon. <laughs> probably, that's probably why the most high chose me. He said, you know, because you didn't even ask me for riches or the, ha- the you know, the heads of your enemies, all these other things that a, that a king thinks is going to make him great. You asked for wisdom so that you could be great, not look great. Not appear great. You ask for wisdom so that you could be great. He said, I'll give you all these other things because I know you ain't even tripping about them. And it's crazy because oftentimes that's always the case. The people who want power and are desperate for it, they're the ones that never find it. Scrounge and scratch, crab in a barrel mentality, constantly looking for a way up, and they never be able to find it. And the man that's saying, look, I'm glad there's somebody in that seat. It ain't got to be me. That's the one that always gets chosen for the seat. Moses was humble. He was the most meek man of the earth. You think when the Most High spoke to him out of the bush, he was like, I've been waiting on this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm about to show him what's up. Moses in the building. No, Moses was meek. He was a humble man. But he got put in a very high position quickly. He, was, he, he had a heart of gold. He was a defender of his people, and he loved his people. Who was another one? King David, a shepherd. He took the job that really didn't nobody want. God made a king. See, it's just so many examples of that. Somebody that ain't really, uh, who, who was that? What was his name? Jerubabel, a.k.a. Uh, Gideon. He was a righteous man holding it down while everybody else was wicked. He was over, uh, I think he was like treading, doing something with some, with some wheat or some over by the mill. I think he was at a mill. Angel came and spoke to him. He was like, me? For real? He said, I right. said, you know, I don't doubt you, Lord. But let me put this, uh, this little piece of something by the door and, you know, let it. Or, you know, he had his little signs and signals. He had his doubts. He's like, are you sure? Me? For real? That's the one that always gets chosen. The one that really ain't looking for that because that's really not what he desires. But when you have that, you got to be careful. You got to protect that. You really do. Because the ways of the wicked can seduce a righteous man, which is exactly what happened to Adam, which is what happened to Solomon, which is what happened to King David. And it's happened to countless other men that may or may not be mentioned in these scriptures. But we have enough examples to see that that can be dangerous, right? Uh, bu- 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 what was we at? Three. Uh, 13. Go ahead. Uh, book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent uh, gullied me, and I did eat. Or God or gu- beguiled. Uh, beguiled me. And I did eat. So, so the crazy part about it is as much as everybody's ready to crucify Adam, and once again, it's not an excuse. Adam obviously did mess up. He let the woman uh, get in his head and convince him to do something that he knew was wrong. But when the Most High looked, the first person that he asked was Eve. What have you done? Something to consider. Go ahead. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, 
Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Uh -huh. And I will put enemy, uh, <laughs> enmity uh -huh. between three and, and the woman, uh, uh, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall be bruised thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh -huh. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So he said, you know, painful childbirth? He said, I'm going to give that to you. More than likely also results in uh, menstrual cycles, right? Get that to you. It, however you bring forth children, or it, it, it's going to be painful now. He said, what else did he say? He said, and your desire is going to be to your husband. You're going to have, now you're going to cling to him. Same way that you was looking for a way to be above him and all this other kind of stuff. Now, somewhere in you, deep down, it's, you, you're going to need him and desire him. Your desire is going to be to him, and he's going to rule over you. He's going to have that authority. Go ahead. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, Curse is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for, for dust thou art, and unto, and unto dust shall thou return. So he said, and Adam, you're going to have a tough time in everything that you're going to do. Thorns and thistles is going to grow. So I, my thing is, it was like, so before this, there were no thorns and thistles, no weeds with them things, them dandelions, you know, the, the real spiky little things, needle grass, <coughs> all these weeds. He was like, it's going to be cursed for your sake. Now you got to you gotta work for it. I can't even imagine. I've been seeing weeds so long in my life. I can't even imagine any level of dirt that ain't got no weeds in it. Even right. if you come across an empty lot somewhere in the city, it ain't even a whole lot of agriculture around here or a whole lot of vegetation. But somehow you got these empty plots of dirt and they be having all kind of weeds in them. Ground covering. They ain't really growing no good grass. Just got weeds and ground covering and just, you know, little oh. stuff that you're going to have to turn over the dirt or, you know, go get up before you can actually do something with that dirt. He said, well, that's going to be your punishment. Everything that you do, you're going to have to do it with the sweat of your face. You have to work for it. Because <clears throat> before that, he had it all, right? He was in the garden. Yeah, he was keeping it and dressing it, but that more so, I would imagine, it looked like when fruits were growing and just falling off the tree. and He pretty much had to, to put the fruit and keep uh, branches from like totally just falling off the tree because everything was coming forth so abundantly. You're going to dress the, uh, the, the garden. Probably some branches that got so heavy on one side, some snapped. What do you call that? What's that? What's that process? Uh, or like you tie I'm up a sure. tree. Ah, what is it called? Grafting. He, he probably had to graft a couple of branches. You know, some stuff like that. But I, but it doesn't really seem like there were weeds and you know just terrible all this stuff he got to work on and bring forth. But now it is for his sake. Go ahead. Oh yeah, verse twenty one. Uh, verse twenty. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and cloth them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the men, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turning every way to keep the weight of the tree of life. Uh, so after that point, Adam was banned from the garden, and he wasn't able to go in, and the Most High put cherubims there to make sure that he had never gone in, because he knew the knowledge of good and evil. So he knew good what was he was supposed to do, but he also knew the possibilities of what he could do, including trying to sneak back in the garden and all this other kind of stuff. So the most I had to protect it and then ended up taking it up. Uh, let's go to First Ezra chapter 3, and 
right, let's start at verse 1. It's the book of First Edris, chapter 3, and verse 1. Now when Darius reigned, he made a great feast unto all his subjects, and unto all his household, and unto all the princes of Media and Persia, and to all the governors and captains and lieutenants that were under him from India unto Ethiopia of 120 and seven provinces. Uh, for the sake of time, let's drive down to verse 5. Verse 5. I'm Let, sorry, verse 4. Verse 4. Then the three young men that were of the guard that kept the king's body spake one to another. Let every one of us speak a sentence. He that shall overcome and whose sentence shall seem wiser than the others, unto him shall the king Darius give great gifts and great things in token of victory. Uh -huh. As to be clothed in purple, to drink in gold, and to sleep upon gold, and a chariot with uh, brittles of gold, and a head, head tire of fine linen, and a chain about his neck. So they basically came together and they was like, look, man, we close to the king. We got an opportunity to be able to talk to him. Most people don't have that advantage. Most people will want to talk to the king and it's like a waiting period of meeting. We'll see if we can get you scheduled in. He said, man, we're of his guard. I'm sure if we prove ourselves to be wise men that we could be rewarded and potentially be in a much better position than where we're at. Uh, drop down to verse 10. So, they each, so each one of them had a sentence. They were pretty much trying to determine who was the strongest. So each one of them came up with uh, and reasoned with within themselves to say, well, I think this is the strongest this and that and so forth. Go ahead. Verse 10. The first wrote, wine is the strongest. Uh -huh. The second wrote, the king is the strongest. The third wrote, women are strongest. But above all things, truth beareth away the victory. Uh, and so they, they got the opportunity to speak. Uh, drop down to verse 16. Verse 16. And he said, call the young men, and they shall declare their own sentences. So they were called and came in. And he said unto them, declare unto us your mind concerning the writings. Then began the first who had spoken of the strength of wine. Uh -huh. And he said, thus, O ye men, how exceedingly strong is wine. It causeth all men to err that drink it. He said, man, wine is the strongest because it makes all men err, makes, you know, makes a man make mistakes. Go ahead. It make it the mind of the king and of the fatherless child to be all one uh -huh. of the bond man and of the free man, of the poor man, of the rich. Now, he's speaking. If you really look at what he's saying, he's really saying some profound things. It make it the mind of the king and of the fatherless child to be all one. Now, look at a king. What we know to be a king is, first and foremost, if he don't have nothing else, he has authority. Even if he's in a small, poor kingdom, he's the one that's calling the shots because he's the king, right? But typically, a king has a province, right? Or he's over an entire kingdom consistent of provinces. He's wealthy. He's powerful. He pushes a button. He's a boss, right? He don't really have to do a whole bunch. Kings get upset. They get in arguments with other kings. They send forth armies. They do all these things, right? But he said... A king and of the fatherless child, the mind will be the same. How is a fatherless child thinking? He's probably sad, right? Probably not in a good position. Probably feels like his life has no purpose. Probably really a sad thought. So if a king drinks too much wine, he could be in that same mindset and completely forget about the things that he has because he's drunk, because he's drinking. You got a little bit of emotion on your heart, and you start drinking, and it's magnifying that emotion. And pretty soon, it's like, man, you beat and forgot you was a king. Man, this is no point. It's just, you know, you know how to, this is no point. The mind of the, of the king and the fatherless child to be one of the bondman and of the free man. <coughs> this man is a bondman. He's a slave. He get off that liquor, he feel free. <laughs> <laughs> the poor man and of the rich. You broke. Boy, he feel rich because he got that liquor in his system. He feel like he can conquer the world in that moment. That liquid courage. Go ahead. Come Verse 20. It turneth also every thought into jollity and mirth, uh -huh. so that a man remembereth neither sorrow nor debt. That's that poor man feeling rich. He, he just get happy. He off that liquor, he happy. Ain't even worry about your problems. And in that sense, it can be a good thing for you. If you got something that you just kind of get through and it ain't really, you know, a whole bunch you could do, you kind of come across those situations in life, you have your little drink, 
Are you, you you happy? You were able to relax? He said, you know, that that's what it does. Go ahead. And it maketh every heart rich, so that a man remembereth neither king nor governor. Uh -huh. And it maketh to speak all things by talents. And when they are in their cups, they forget their love both to friends and brethren, and a little after draw out swords. Uh -huh. <laughs> but when they are from the wine, they remember not what they have done. And it can also make you make a fool out of yourself. You didn't be you be you be drinking, and, and you get the man. You be get the tripping sometimes. You got the people, <laughs> oh. <laughs> boy. They get real aggressive off that cup. Get to hitting that cup like a champ. You, <laughs> <clears throat> you be like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hold on, yeah, hold on, champ. Let's slow down a little bit. He didn't be forgot the love of his friend and his brethren. Hey, man, that's a nice shirt, man. This nigga trying to be funny. <laughs> man, what's happening? Get the sword out. Uh oh. Wake up in the morning. I did what? God, that's that's the power of that liquor, boy. But that, but that's real facts. Either you've made God. those mistakes or you've seen people make those mistakes. It was like, damn, man, last night was crazy. Boy, that liquor got the floor and them cuss was clacking and man, it, it really got it really got active last night. But that's all off of liquor. So what he's saying really is important, and what it is. Or what he's saying is, is really powerful. Go ahead. O ye men, is not wine the strongest that enforces to do thus? And when he had so spoken, he held his peace. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then the second that had spoken of the strength of the king began to say, O ye men, do not men excel in strength that bear rule over sea and land and all things in them? But yet the king is more mighty. For he is Lord of all these things and hath dominion over them. And whatsoever he commanded them, they do. If he bid them make war uh, one against another, they do it. If he send them out against the enemies, they go. And break it down mountains, walls, and towers. Uh -huh. They slay and are slain. And transgress not the king's commandment. If they get the victory, they bring all to the king as well the spoil as all things else. So he also speaking facts, right? He said, man, the king can make men go to war. You go to war, you fighting strangers. You ain't, a, you go to war, you on the front line. You sitting there, everybody war crying, they running at each other. You see the pupils and the, the whites of the other man's eyes. You don't know who this is. You don't know what kind of family he got, how many kids he got, who waiting on him at home. All you know is you're a soldier and you've been told these are the enemies. Go and fight. You be out there fighting for your life. Fighting as if you had the problem, right? Develop a hatred for your enemies and all kind of stuff. All because a king said, we're at war. Woo, that's powerful, right? For one man to yield that kind of power, that's hella powerful. He said, uh, they go and break down mountains, walls, and towers. We're not going to be able to get the army. Uh, we're not going to be able to get the, the carriages and the supplies, the elephants through this valley. We're going to have to dig out this wall three feet on either side. The passage might be 100 feet. Guess what? You were a soldier. Now you're a construction worker. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll get some men on it right away. We'll break this mountain out with, our, with, with, with uh, pickaxes, and we'll get the carriages and the supplies through. Walls and towers. You get to a city that you may not have ever seen in your life. Well, the enemies are on the other side of this wall. We came all this way. We got to figure out a way through this wall. We can't go over it, we can't go under it. We're gonna have to break through the wall. We're gonna have to get some battering rams and we're gonna have to get this and get that. They, all these things that get formulated, all these ideas, all this innovation. Now mind you, the men, as intelligent as it takes to be able to formulate a plan like that, they easily could have probably been architects or, or construction workers, uh, philosophers, but they're soldiers. And they're risking life and limb, knowing that they got families, all for a man that Nine times out of ten is sitting back at home with his family. You know we're at war right now. Don't come in here with that. You know, he act like he frustrated. What about the men that's really out there? Men that's really watching people to their left and to their right die and get killed and get arms cut off and legs cut off. People begging for their life, blood spread everywhere. That's a lot more intense. And they're doing all of that just because a king said, I got a problem with this king or I got a problem with these people and I want you to go destroy them. Ooh, that's power, ain't it? That's a lot of strength. Uh, 
He said, they slay and are slain. Some people don't come back from that war. Some people live to tell the tale, but some people go out to that war that they got told to go to, and they die there. Their bodies are left on that battlefield. Hopefully they get buried, but some, not all get buried. He said, and they don't transgress his commandments. And here's the crazy part. He said, if they get the victory, they shall bring all to the king as well as the spoil. So even after risking all of that, knowing that they left their kids, knowing that they may never even see them again, all the gold and the treasures and the things that they took, they give it to the king. <laughs> the dude that stayed home. How much power does he really have? Quite a bit. Go ahead. Verse 6. Likewise, for those that are no soldiers and have not to do with wars, but use husband, uh, husbandry, when they have reaped again that which they have sown, they bring it to the king and compel one another to pay tribute unto the king. Uh -huh. And yet he is but one man. If he commands to kill, they kill. If he commands to spare, they spare. He said, man, even if they're not men of war, if they sit out there working all day, they may, you may never even have seen the king. Ain't never, it, may, it may be a man that ain't never walked amongst the people, ain't never went to go see the so-called peasants that's, that's growing the food. But everything that they get, we got 50, carries, uh, 50 carrots, my lord. All right, well, I want 10 of them. And they giving up the carrots, knowing that he the one that got the seeds. He the one that been out in the, the hot summer sun all, you know, all his time. He the one that was out in the cold planting seeds and waiting for spring and watering and all this stuff. But when the king tell them it's time to give it up, they giving it up. And it says they compel one another. They got so much loyalty to the king. Hey, man, right. didn't I say you grow some potatoes? Right. Did you pay your taxes? Oh, no, nah, man, you got to get down there and pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> they compelling one another. Like, what? Go ahead. Verse 8. If he command to smite, they smite. If he command to make desolate, they make desolate. If he command to build, they build. If he command to cut down, they cut down. If he command to plant, they plant. So all his people and his armies obey him. Furthermore, he lieth down. He eateth and drinketh and taketh his rest. Mm -hmm. And these keep watch round about him. Neither may anyone depart and do his own business. Neither disobey they him in anything. So if he say to hit, they going to hit. If he says to build, they're going to build. I want a tower over here in this corner. I think we should use some extra defenses. Right away, king. Well, we need about uh, 600 men to build this tower. Let's make it happen. We got, we got the, we, we've been commissioned, and that's all it takes. The king, the king snapped his fingers, and that's all it is. Uh, you know what? I know y'all built that. Changed my mind. I don't like it. Tear it down. Get right away, king. And that's all it takes. He makes a decision for the, on the behalf of the entire kingdom, and everybody is subject unto what it is that he says. He's talking about real power. And then it says he lies down and he drinks. He chilling. Yeah, chilling. He might be chilling, right? And it says, and the men that watch him, they can't even leave. What you, what you mean you a king's guard and you got caught at the store? Man, I just needed, you know what I'm saying? I, man, I just got so hungry. I just wanted to come down here and give me a little bread or something. Off with his head. I was just so hungry. I just wanted a cluster of grapes. Man, I didn't get to go shopping yesterday. If, if I wait till I get off my shift and I get relieved by another guard, I won't be able to make it down to the marketplace. I, man, I don't want much in this life, king. I just wanted a little bit of wine. So you left my, my bedside vulnerable to enemies for wine? Off with his head. That's it. That, that's all it is. That's all it takes. You disobeyed the king. You left the king vulnerable. Off with his head. Hang him in the gallows. Make it a public event. I want his face on posters, 1,500 of them. Spread them throughout the kingdom. Tell everybody to come watch this dude get his head cut off or, or watch him get hung from the gallows. All because the king says so. Go ahead. Verse 12. O ye men. How should not the king be mightiest when in such sort he is obeyed? And he held his tongue. Then the third who had spoken of women and of the truth, this was Zerubbabel, began to speak. O ye men, is it not the great king, nor the multitude of men? Neither is it wine that excelleth. Who is it then that ruleth them, or hath the lordship over them? Are they not women? So now this last man, he's saying, nah, it's not wine. It's not the king. He said, who has rule over both of those? Isn't it women? Go ahead. 
Women have borne the king and all the people that bear rule by sea and land. Even of them came they, and they nourished them up that planet, the vineyards from whence the wine cometh. These also make garments for men. These bring glory unto men, and without women cannot men be. Ye, and if men have gathered together gold and silver or any other goodly thing, do they not love a woman which is comely and favor and beauty? And letting all those things go, do they not uh, gape and even with open mouth fix their eyes fast on her? And have not all men more desire unto her than unto silver or gold or any goodly thing whatsoever? Uh -huh. A man leaveth his own father that brought him up in his own country and cleaveth unto his wife. Now look at all that he said. Once again, all these men had wisdom. You can see that they had wisdom, but look what he's saying. He said, man, uh, women have given birth to the king and all them that rule over the land, the sea, the, you know, all this kind of stuff. You have a great conqueror that he was born of a woman. Every king born of a woman. He said, they make garments for men. They, they clothe in the men. He said, without a woman, men can't even be. He can gather all the gold and silver, and he's still going to want somebody to share it with. Now, he might have 50 pounds of gold in the back. He's still looking at a woman. Man, you got all the gold in the world. You should be happy. You got everything that you want. But he's still going to let a woman catch his eye. He walking down the street. He, oh, wow, look at that. You got all the gold you need, but somehow she's just going to catch your eye in a way that that gold may not catch your eye. Now, that gold is important. It's something you're going to hustle for. It's something you work hard for. But it's something about that woman that's going to make a man, it's going to catch him. You're going to have his mouth open. Wow. Oh. It says, uh, and a man will leave his own father. You really don't start to appreciate your dad until you get older. When you're a kid, that's more so when everything's mommy, 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 mommy. You know, mom's feeding me, mom's clothing me, mom's dressing me, mom's helping me, mom's so sweet, mom's so nice, I love you, mommy. But then when you get older and you start having to take on responsibilities, then you understand, oh, man, wow, maybe dad wasn't such a bad guy. Maybe right. him waking me up every morning at 6 a.m. was so that I can learn discipline and how to get up out of bed and, and chase after something as opposed to just always being comfortable. Maybe he, you know, said this and said that, even though it was hurtful at the time, actually makes a lot more sense now. He said, man, but even after everything that you start to realize that your father is to you and has done for you, you'll leave him to go and be with this woman who you just met. Man might be 40 years old. Well, back then they lived a lot longer. Most men nowadays ain't waiting 40 years. But if a man lived, you know, however many years and he waited till he was 40 years old, he had a lot of time to spend with his father learning a lot of wisdom, works with him, learns the, uh, the tricks and tips of the trade and all this other kind of stuff, seeing his father in so many different situations and dynamics, and he's still willing to leave his father, who he's known all his life, who's brought him up and educated him, to go and be with a woman that oftentimes he really just met. Even if you, even if you are in a J uh, Jacob situation, he had to work seven years for her, right, for his first wife. He still just met her in comparison to how long he knew his father. You knew your father for 80 years before you got married. You meet a woman and work for her for seven. You've known your father 80 years longer than you've known this woman. Uh -huh. But you're willing to leave him to go be with her. That's how much of a pull and a power that a woman has over a man. Go ahead. Where we at? Uh, verse 21. Yes. Verse 21. He sticketh not to spend his life with his wife and remembereth neither father nor mother, nor country. By this also ye must know that women have dominion over you. Do ye not labor and toil and give and bring all to the woman? Oof. Go ahead. Yea, a man taketh his sword and goeth his way to rob and steal to sell upon the sea and upon rivers, and looketh upon a lion and goeth in the darkness, and when he hath stolen, spoiled, and robbed, and bring it to his love. He said he brings it to his love. So look at all that he's saying about the woman. He said, don't, do, don't you know that a woman have a, a dominion over you? You labor and toil. You bring all that you got back to this woman. You working hard. She might be at the house. And I'm not, and, and it's an honorable thing for a woman to actually take on the, uh, the role of a wife and a mother. Don't let America discredit what that means to our nation. The nation is comprised of households. Every household is either a brick or a weak spot. 
So when a woman is playing her role and she's building this man up, keeping him strong, oftentimes they say behind every powerful man, there's a woman. Now, there can either be a woman that's really like the black pope, manipulating and, and the puppeteer, calling the shots in, in, in her ways of manipulation or deceit, or she could be helping this man out. He could have insecurity. She, she wiping him out. Baby, what? So what would they say? Baby, you great. You've been great. I have. <laughs> <laughs> you like, <laughs> oh, man, a woman can make you feel like the greatest thing since sliced bread, or she can make you feel lower than dirt. And he said, all that you do, you working, you busting your behind. Look at all these construction workers. Man, we, man, be out in the hot sun, the back of your neck burning, your face and your hands darker than any other part of your body. You're dirty, you're dusty, you took uh -huh. a shower, you still ashy. <laughs> wow. It's hard labor. But guess who he thinking about? He get that check. He ain't just be like, man, I mean, yeah, you got to have your plans for yourself. And you thinking about where you're going to invest. But you know dang well, somewhere in that check, you're thinking about what you're going to do with your wife. I want to take her on a date. We're going to get this bottle, have this drink, and we're going to spend this amount. And maybe you get real disciplined. You'd be like, man, we ain't going to spend over $200 a month. <laughs> but you still going to spend it with her. <laughs> you still going to give it to her, though. He said, what did he say? He said, a man taketh his sword. They go to rob and steal. They sell it upon the seas and the rivers. These pirates and all this kind of stuff. They still looking for the woman at the end of the day. He said, he looketh upon a lion. You know it's dangerous out there. It's real in the field. I saw a lion today. I hope he don't come this way. I hope he didn't smell this or catch on to that or follow this sinner. Man, it's real out here. He said, he goeth in darkness. You don't know what's in the dark. And oftentimes, the mental fear of the unknown is greater than the actual obstacles in your way. But he's willing to face that unknown. He's willing to face that fear because he's trying to do something for his woman. He said he has stolen, spoiled, and robbed. He did all this. You're taking on risk. You break down the door. You know it might be somebody behind there just as prepared to die for what they got as, as much as you are to die for, for, for trying to succeed, right? He said, but he do all that. When he get it, he going to take it to the woman. Oof. Take it, he bringeth it to his love. Go ahead. Wherefore, a man loveth his wife better than father or mother. But he loved his woman more than his father and mother. You love your mama. You've been, man, you probably didn't celebrate it. How, Lord knows how many birthdays, bought her all these gifts. You love her so much. You tell her she's beautiful. I love you, mama, so much. Love your dad. You start to have that real appreciation for him as you get older. You face challenges as a man. And he kind of hit you with that. I told you so. You know, you go through your different stages. You learn a lot as you progress in life. And it becomes all the more real to you. But for all that familiarity and for all that love, for all that uh, uh, acquainted, acquainted, however acquainted y'all are, you'll leave that to go be with your woman. I'm going to go build my house. I'm going to go live with, with my woman now. Go ahead. Yay. Many there be that have run out of their wits for women Ooh. and become servants for their sakes. Many lose their mind behind these women. Man, this Jake used to be intelligent, used to be smart. Man, before you got with her, you would have never made no decision like that. What's going <laughs> on? Yeah. You, you know somebody yeah. and you did it because you laughing. <laughs> hey, but, yeah. but that's real. Man, and, and, and most men, by, by, by this stage in life, you, at least, if you in your 20s, more than likely you've already had your moment or you living in a moment where you done lost your mind for this woman. Whether it be in you can't reason because she's enticing you. Are you sure you want to go out with your friends or you want to stay home with me? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I told him I was going to, I give him my word. And, man, that how you losing your mind. She getting in your head. She might make you jealous. You might lose your mind. Stuff don't even make sense. But you losing your mind because this woman is involved. She got, a, she got a way of knowing you. She got a way of pushing those buttons. She got a way of presenting herself as soft, even though she might be really aggressive. She got a way of, of hiding behind that femininity or using that, femi uh, that femininity to get what she wants. <clears throat> I was talking to a brother today, man. We had a conversation. He was like, man, you know, you're kind of sharp. You, sh you should probably be a lawyer. He said, man, I had this lawyer... Um, that was in L.A. He, you know, he just started telling me the story. He started talking to me, and I'm listening. He said this woman, and, I, and he showed me the picture of her. She was a beautiful woman, very beautiful woman. And he said that he went to court 
Um, first and foremost, she had taxed him bad. Probably also knew that she wasn't going to get him off with that much. And he was like, man, I basically lost some money. But she was getting paid, so she didn't stop him, right? She went in court, and he said that she had on a tight dress, high heels, hair all laid down, diamond necklaces. You know, she turning heads. She had something to tell the judge. She's like, judge, I need to tell you something. Can I approach you? He said, yeah. The other lawyer like, hold on. You know, the DA, he like, hold on. What you mean? I, if it's something about the case, I need to be involved. She said, no, it's not about the case. He's like, no, I still need to hear. He said, no, it's not about the case. The judge like, all right, you stay over there. Come on and approach me. This dude said, she went up to the judge and said, I don't like when you wear glasses. You look kind of old. I like you better in your contacts. So when they took their recess, guess what he came back oh. with? <laughs> Guess what he came back with? His contacts. glasses was off, and he had his contacts in. This is a powerful man. This is a judge. He says yes or no to people's lives. Yes, you get more money. No, you don't get more money. Yes, you're going to jail. No, you're not going to jail. You off scot free. You got life in prison. That man has power. And this little beautiful woman. With, with knowing, and obviously she working it, right? She already know the power that she has, so she uses it to her advantage. What that got to do with the case? But she already in his head. And he said, man, he was like, man, it was incredible. You ever get you a lawyer, make sure you get you a beautiful woman and this, this, and that, because the way that she was able to work this judge. Then she said something simple. They, he, uh, I think that they was in court for, like, child support. He said uh, she asked for, like, $50 a day, which is, like, $1,000 a month. The female lawyer responded, well, that's not fair to my client. Take care of your own kids. The judge was like, yeah, yeah, take care of your own kids. I'm like, man, there's so many situations. She may not have been able to take care of her children. She, what does she got to work during the day? It's only $50 a day to put your kids, and I'm not going to say only as if that's nothing, but, you know, that's not impossible money. But sure enough, the judge already, he got his nose wide open. He's smelling after her. Oh, my God, she likes me with my, with my contacts. Right. <laughs> so she won the case. And it may, of course, you know, I imagine she's a certain level of intelligent, but she can use that, right? So I said many have lost their, have run out of their wits for women. That's just a, just an example. And it's, it's crazy that that, I literally had that conversation today. And he was just telling me how mind blown he was at how intelligent this woman was, how beautiful this woman was, how she knew how to work that femininity to get what she wanted and how she was able to, Basically, call a shot by being feminine. Something so small. You know, the judge probably thinking she about to approach with some law. He's in work mode. She's going to state, you know, I, I expect, I, you know, I kind of know what defense she's going to use. She's probably going to state this penal code under this section and this, this, and that. This is what I expect, and this is what I expect. And I guess it's circumstantial. If I, you know, he's, he's calculating all those things. She walk up to him and say, I like you better with your contacts. He probably immediately just fell apart mentally. Oh, I thought this was about law. <laughs> just instantly, just out of there. Just instantly in the clouds, head in the clouds. Oh, my gosh. Comes back with the contacts, though. I'm like, damn, bro, the fact that you actually right. did it. <laughs> but that's power. She know. <laughs> it's crazy, man. It said, uh, and become servants for their sakes. You know, you, you, I always saw that on TV. You know, this woman, she, she ain't got to do a whole bunch. <sighs> <laughs> Shake that cup. Everybody mm -hmm. come with a drink. You, you right. need a drink? Want some water? Well, I'll get it. You becoming a servant. Like, man, you a sucker, right? You a sucker. You becoming uh. a servant for her sake. She ain't even, let's keep it real. She ain't looked your way and gave you no real attention. Y'all ain't touched, felt nothing. You ain't done nothing. But you already willing to be a servant just because there's something about this woman that has caught your eye. You just, just for the possibility, just for the hope of being able to get some type of attention and, you know, letting your imagination run wild, you became a servant. They call that simping, right? Oh. Go ahead. This is powerful. Verse 27. Many also have perished and have erred and sinned for women. Look what he said in that one sentence. Many also have perished. People get killed behind women. And there's two right. ways that that happens. You messing with my, you know, a man messing with another man's girl, you messing with my girl, he get killed over that because he's super overprotective about a woman. Whole time, that woman might have been entertaining that conversation. Whole time, she batting her eyes and, and smiling and winking. He didn't even know she was with somebody. 
But that other man, like, nah, man, I trust her. I believe her. I love her. It must have been you. You must be the predator. You must be the snake in the grass. He had you off the whole time. You was innocent. Whole time. And it's happened. It has happened. Uh, there was another one. Man, I heard a song. He said, uh, some, some, man, I thought that was your chick. She set you up, caught with your out. I said, wow. Even the street, the, the street niggas know. We need to get. We need to catch him up. We might not be able to catch him. We might not catch him at a stop sign or stoplight. We can't hit the block. It's hella people outside. But you know what we could do? You know who gonna get through the defenses? This woman. This is his name. This what he look like. This is his Instagram. You go up to him. He be, he he be at this club every Saturday night. Every Saturday night. It must be something wrong with him if he's not there. He gonna be in the VIP section all the way in the back. He don't like if you just throw it at him. You're going to have to play hard to get it. So you're going to sit at the corner uh, of the bar right there under the light where he can see you, but never look his way. So now he got all these women that's around him. They dancing. They want to do whatever he wants. And he's like, damn, why isn't she fascinated? Why hasn't she come over yet? Oh, she already in his head. And she just waiting. She over there playing, biding her time on her second drink in three hours. <laughs> Chilling, right? Waiting for him to notice to come over because she needs another drink. And then next thing you know, the bartender slides something on across. Oh, that was from the man uh, down there at the bar. Mm -hmm. And she gets a little, oh, man, it'd be cold. Don't it? But that's really what happens. These are real stories. Like many have erred. And it says have sinned. Adam sinned. David sinned. Solomon sinned. So many men have sinned, lost their wits, haven't been wise, have died because they're involved with, the, with a woman and with the wrong woman. Go ahead. And now do you not believe me and not the king great in his power? Do not all reigns fear to touch him? Uh -huh. Yet did I see him and uh, upon, upon me the king's concubine? The daughter of the admiral, the admirable, uh, Baraticus, setting uh, at the right hand of the king uh -huh. and taking the crown from the king's head and setting it upon her own head, she also struck the king with her left hand. Oh, look at that. He said, look how powerful the woman is. Since we've been in here, his concubine took the crown off his head, and he probably reached for it back, and she slapped him. She well, not slapped him in the face, but probably just hit his hand, you know, playing around. Anybody else take the, king, the crown off the king's head? That's a, mer that's a death sentence. Uh -huh. My God, he touched the king. It's probably going to be a slow death. They're probably going to make an example out of him. Cut the hand, now the arm, now the shoulder. Man. But she took the crown off his head. She playing with him. He reaching back for it. And clearly other people were watching for him to have given that account. And she popping him, and he just, <laughs> you know, playing and laughing, probably smiling. He like, look what, look what you letting her do to you, bro. You the king. We all in here watching this happen. Do you understand? Like what Cat Williams said, do you know that I can see you? Right. <laughs> you know what it, like, bro, we watching you. Can't believe you let the, you going to let her do that to you? But because that's his woman, and he got this soft spot, he extra tender. He, he got his eyes wide open. He letting it happen. Oh, the power of that woman, boy, I tell you. Go ahead. Verse 31. And yet for all this, the king gaped and gazed upon her with open mouth. If she laughed upon him, he laughed also. But if she took any displeasure at him, the king was fain to flatter that she might be reconciled to him again. And it's crazy. It said he, he had his mouth open, wide open for her, too. It says she laughed upon him. She laughing at him. He going to laugh with her. Ain't going to get all sour, bent out of shape. He's going to laugh at it, too. It might not even be the most funny thing to him, but he's going to chuckle a little bit because he see that she cracking up. You know, I call that the courtesy laugh. Go give her a courtesy laugh. Boy. Then it said, uh, he said, but if she's angry at him, she's displeased with him, he's fain to flatter. Oh, baby, you look nice today. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you did you get the flowers I sent you? <laughs> like now all of a sudden he tried to do everything that he can. He's feigning the flatter. He's quick to try to do something to get her back uh, in his favor. You the king. He's the king. But because that's the woman that he loves, it could be a million other women. But if that's the woman that he loves, that's the one that he's trying to please and and 
and and get to to uh, be cool with him again. That's the one that he's sitting up there working with, so she can be reconciled with him. Go ahead. Oh, ye men, how can it be? But women should be strong, seeing they do this. Uh huh. Then the king and the prince looked one upon another, so he began to speak of the truth. So they're looking at each other like, wow. And then he starts speaking of the truth. And we know out of, um, out of the scriptures, it says, thy law is the truth. I believe that's Psalms uh, 119, 142. Go ahead. Uh, o ye men, are not women strong? Great is the earth, high is the heaven, swift is the sun in its course. For he compasseth the heavens round about and fetcheth. His course again to his own place in one day. Is he not great that maketh these things? Therefore, great is the truth and stronger than all things. So he said, look at how the, the heaven is, the, the, the sun runs its course. Everything is already set. He said, great is he that made these things. And, and he, being the most high, also made this law, which is stronger than the woman. Because it don't matter how intelligent she is. It doesn't matter how uh, much she knows her husband. Doesn't matter how much she knows how to work that femininity, the law says what it says. He's the head. You got with a man that you feel like is less intelligent than you, that's who you married. So if you feel like you can outsmart him and all this other kind of stuff and I should be in charge, no, 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 no. Not what this Bible says. If you feel like you should be able to make the decisions, you shouldn't have to ask. I got to ask him if I can leave. Grown ain't woman. No, no, no. Says he's the head. He has dominion over you. You're subject. No, 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 no. The law is greater than the woman. That's what brings her back down. If she so chooses, if she desires what I, if she desires salvation, she'll get brought back down. Uh, go ahead. We have verse 35. Con. Is he not great that maketh these things? Therefore, great is the truth and stronger than all things. All the earth calleth upon the truth, and the heaven blessed it. All works shake and tremble at it, and with it is no unrighteous thing. Mm -hmm. Wine is wicked. The king is wicked. Women are wicked. All the children of men are wicked, and such are all their wicked works. And there is no truth in them. In the unrighteousness also they shall perish. Uh -huh. As for the truth, it endureth, and it and is always strong. It liveth and conquereth forevermore. He said, wine is wicked, the king is wicked, men is wicked, women is wicked. He said, but the truth endures. This law is going to be forever. This law is going to stay around, and it's been around since the beginning. This is what's going to endure. So, you know, all that to say, Adam lost his wits. I think, I think it's safe to say with the hell that McCall was giving King David, I, I would... I really, I mean, it, 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 it just seems evident to me that she had to have been a part of that cause. King David was a righteous man. He feared the most high. He went before, he went with Israel to war. He wasn't a normal king. He wasn't just going to send people forth. What up? He wasn't just going to send people forth. He was going to war with the men of Israel. What would make him have so much faith, be up in the middle of the night, and then look at a, a at a woman bathing and say, "Hey, go get her." Probably not thinking. And usually, and I, I and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep it real. I think as a man, most of the time, if you have a woman that's giving you hell, things that you normally wouldn't even go for, and other women start to become more attractive. It kind of starts to lower what you're looking for because you're looking for that peace so badly uh -huh. that you're really just looking for that peace. You know, Big Shirley started to, you know, hey, you know, I ain't never noticed Big Shirley kind of pretty, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know what? She actually is. She got a real sweet heart. You start looking at things. And, I, you know, I'm being facetious to kind of lighten that, that, that blow. But to keep it real, that's a lot of times where a man starts to lose his mind, starts to not do the things that he would normally do because a woman is involved. Now, this is not to say that every single thing is a woman's fault and every single man that has ever fallen is only because of a woman. I'm not saying that. But look at how powerful women are. And look at how many women have chosen to use it. As much as women, even in Israel, especially in Israel and especially in this day and age, they always try to paint the men as evil. Now, I don't deny that there are wicked men out there. But I read about, I read about a lot more women than I do men. 
I know more dragons than I do lions. A man is always portrayed as big and strong, and oftentimes a woman can't beat you physically. Most men are significantly larger and stronger than their wives. Unless you just got one of them couples, and there's nothing wrong with it. If that's what you like, that, you know, you got this big woman and that little bitty dude, and they, you know, worst come to worst, she might get them. Mm-hmm. You see those, too. You know what I'm talking about? You're crazy, man. You might somebody see those, for too. Somebody. Right. You, you know about, you must know somebody, because it's like, oh, uh, hold on, man. You know, you might be one of the men that you might have to lower your voice sometimes. You got you, a, you got you, a, you know. But the thing is, <laughs> But, but most of the time, women aren't physically stronger than their men, right? So what does that lead them to do? Well, I can't just swing on them and beat them up. It's, not, it's never going to work. So you know what they end up doing? They become passive aggressive. They become passive aggressive. They'll start quoting you at times that you trusted them in confidence. They'll start bringing up old mistakes. They'll start twisting your guilt and your conscience against you. They'll destroy your reputation. I can't touch them physically. I can't beat them. But you know who can? I know this man is over authority. Uh, or, or has him under his authority. I won't talk to my husband no more. He's not listening. He's not doing what I want to. I'll go to somebody that he respects, somebody that he admires. I'll go to somebody who can push a button and, and ruin his life or who can push a button and just change things for him. I'll go to him, destroy his reputation in his sight, probably use this femininity if it works, and I got him where I want him. That's real. That really happens all the time. And that's and now, now, like I said, if the shoe fits, then wear it. If you're not one of these women, don't take offense. I see a lot, oftentimes you can see, just like the scriptures say, believe in Proverbs 31, if, if he has a wise woman, he'll be known in the gates. When you see these good women and you see good wives, they're caring for their children, they're so loving and sweet, and they're they're helpful in building their husbands up, they're known in Israel. Brothers be like, man, you got you blessed. I not talking about nothing physical. The way that your woman treats you, the way that she loves your children as her children, the way that she's always willing to do for you, the way, you know, she'll get up at 3 in the morning if that's the time that you came home and cook for you, the way that she's uplifting you, the way that she don't try to tear you down but speaks life into you. Not every man has that. You blessed, I. That's a blessing. So if you're one of those women, don't take offense to this. But if you're not... Uh, let's go to stay, let's stay in Ezra, go to over to second Ezra chapter seven. Only a couple more. Chapter seven, uh, verse, uh, 45, we're going to read through 49. Look at second Ezra chapter seven and verse 45. Uh-huh. Then shall no man be able to save him that is destroyed, nor to oppress him that hath gotten the victory. I answered then and said, this is my first and last saying, that it had been better not to have given the earth unto Adam or else when it was given him to have restrained him from sinning. Uh For what profit is it for men now in this present time to live in heaviness and after death to look for punishment. O thou Adam, what hast thou done? Hold on right there. He says, so first he was speaking about the kingdom, and then he says, uh, he said, man, it was better that you had never given, given Adam the world the way that you did. And he said, and if you did, then to restrain him, to keep him from sinning. And it's crazy. This is mind-blowing to me personally because I always used to get uh, frustrated. Um, especially when there were things that had to be done and I was doing my part, but somebody else wasn't doing theirs. Specifically, man, the, 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 man, I used to get so mad, like in elementary school or in school, they'd be like, we're not leaving until everybody's quiet. All right. And you got that one kid that's like, now it's showtime. <laughs> it's time to show out. Oh, my God, I'd be so mad in the class because I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, and I'm doing what I want to do. They say sit quietly with your hands folded or whatever the stipulation was, and there I am, ready to go. And here go a little so-and-so. They got to show out. They cracking jokes. And for a little while, they be funny. They get them few people that, that really ain't in too much of a rush. They get some laughs. Then eventually, they take it so far that everybody mad. Boy, I used to be mad the whole time. Wait till we get to lunch. <laughs> oh, I'm so angry. <laughs> I'm a man. I'm so mad. I want to go. And it's crazy because the scriptures, the most high set it up for us to be the same way. 
we don't we don't really succeed or fail as individuals oftentimes. And that's why Israel had to be kept clean all the time. Somebody sinned, you, you know, especially if it was a sin worthy of death, you got to put them to death. Oftentimes the entire congregation will partake of it, so, such as the act of adultery. Um, I believe in certain circumstances they were, to be in, they were to be stoned, and in one of them they was to be burned. I'm like, whoa, talk about a death, a death sentence. And all Israel had to stone them with stones. Everybody had to grab a rock. Throw it. You cast yours in there too. Because that's going to do two things. First and foremost, it's going to be example. Anybody that had that thought, that thought is gone. Anybody talking to somebody they shouldn't have been talking to, that conversation is over. You got some people that got stoned and people got ghosted after that. I don't want to talk no more. You know what? This is wrong. Even more so, if you grabbed a rock and threw it, how much more are you going to feel convicted if you ever fall into a situation where you're considering doing that very act that you were trying to hang or kill somebody for <clears throat> it would have chased sin out of out of the minds and hearts of israel it would have chased sin out of the camp then you have examples like uh, a khan right he took the babylonian garment and some shekels they went into babylon most high sometimes the most high said y'all can take whatever you want to all the spoils whatever it is that you want at one time uh, concubines were authorized for the men of israel to take he said whatever it is and then there were other times that he said don't touch nothing Kill everything and burn the rest or don't take anything. A Khan took it upon himself. He saw a Babylonian garment and some shekels. He took it, hid it, put it under his tent, and all a whole bunch of Israel start dying. It seemed like, you know, a, a bunch of people outside of him were being touched. You would think it would just be him. He getting plagues and he getting diseases and he's having all these problems. And it's like, well, he must have messed up. Most high said, no, I'm going to test the things around him. <laughs> and then he's, you know, they, they and it's crazy because uh, Bishop Tzaiwan just broke this down. I believe this past Sabbath, he said uh, the most high knew who it was and why these things were coming upon him. But he said, y'all go figure out who did it. Y'all go ask your questions. And everybody had to present themselves one by one. Everybody who was at that battle, I need you to, you to come and, and we need to talk about where you were. They had to, you know, detective style. So where were you at 915? So, you, so you're telling me you came in the house, you walked through the door, <laughs> sat down right. yep. at 9.15. They had to do that for all the men that went out to that battle, and they finally came across him, and he didn't die alone. He died. It was him, I believe his wives, his children, like everything that he owned, everything had to be destroyed. And that's another thing that I always think about. So many women who really don't have the monster husbands that they portray to have, who really don't have the Nabal husbands that they portray to have, they just got issues with their husband. He probably said something you didn't like. May not have even been a reviler purposefully trying to hurt you out of maliciousness, but said something that rubbed you the wrong way, and now all of a sudden he's wicked and brothers need to be talked to and all this other kind of stuff. Ah, I'm sure. My whole thing is, you better read these scriptures. Man, if I'm as terrible as you say I am, and I'm as wicked and as close to death as you say I am, you better hustle your, you better hustle your, man your behind off to make sure I get it right because if I go down I may not go down alone there were a number of times that men in Israel rebelled or sinned and their them their wives and their children and everything that they had got destroyed with them for their actions so all these women in the truth that swear up and down that their husbands are so evil and I hate them so much and I'm like God you just, you, just, well, you better hope you better hope he get right for the most high start touching both of y'all and that'll really show you the intent of your heart. That'll really show where you're at. Because if you really want him to get right and you're really seeking salvation and you really don't want anything to compromise your salvation, then you'll be a hell of a lot more invested in how can I help him. But if it's only about exposing him, destroying him, tearing him down, he didn't do what I wanted, so I'm going to punish him. Well, then if he sins, all you want to do is make him look bad in the sight of men. And all you want to do is because you can't beat them up and you can't put your hands on them, you can't bring the hammer down. You'll go find someone with a hammer. Assess that within yourself, everyone who watches. It. Assess that, sisters, women, wives, mothers. Assess that. What's your real intention at the things that you do? Is it really because you want to see him get right so you're going to someone who's in a position of authority or someone who he respects and will hearken to? Or is it only about your personal vendetta because you don't have a hammer so you'll go find someone with one? You better hope you better hope he get right before it's both of y'all for real.
Read these scriptures. Look at, look at how the Most High was moving amongst Israel. Look at how he dealt with Israel. We hardly ever fall or die alone. Is that all of that? Uh, you want it uh, through 49? We on 48. Uh, yes. Okay, so 48. Read 48 from the top. Verse 48. O thou Adam, what hast thou done? For though it was thou that sinned, thou art not fallen alone, but we are that come of thee. Look at that. Most high said it. He said, man, Adam, what have you done? He said, even though it was you that sinned, we're all the ones that are affected. Adam was affected too. But Adam has come and he, he's lived and died. But look at us, his descendants. However many years later, thousands, thousands of years later, still with weeds in our gardens, still with sweat of our brow, how we survive, working, hustling, scrounging, scraping. Still in that same position. And another thing he said, uh, and I didn't include it in this lesson, but there's a scripture that says the old paths were easy and wide. It was easy to, to have eternal life. He said then that those ways were made narrow. Now you see the scripture, uh, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But narrow, straight is the gate. Narrow is the path that leads to life. Uh, that was all of that. Let's go over to Sirach chapter 7, verse 26. It's the book of Sirach, chapter 7, and verse 26. Hast thou, hast thou a wife after thy mind? Uh -huh. Forsake her not, uh -huh. but give not thyself over to a light woman. So he says, you have a woman that's after your mind, don't forsake her. You know how difficult that is for a man and a woman to actually agree on their mentalities, their mindsets? A lot, oftentimes, especially as men, and especially in this day and age, because I feel like, well, I mean, like, it's pretty well known. This is like the loneliest generation to have lived, right? Everybody's so connected on social media. No one's actually talking in real life. No, I can't. Oftentimes sure. people are, right? That's facts, right? Oftentimes people are, um, you know, people are drawn to each other because we don't really know how to prove a friend. We don't really know how to have these interactions and have these conversations and oftentimes we go over things that are only surface deep. He's handsome. He has a six pack. He got this. He got that. Oh, my gosh. He probably has this and probably has that. She got them. You know what I'm saying? She got those hips. She got that shape. She got that hair. It's always physical. It's always surface deep. You like uh, off, off color tangerine orange? Me too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it'd be something that ain't really relevant to a marriage. That is not going to help y'all at all if somebody goes through a real devastating time of their life. You know, I, I didn't really start to understand how important a marriage was until, man, like a, oh, just barely a year in, um, my mother died. Two months later, my father-in-law died. So I lost a parent and she lost a parent within two months of each other. That's when things became a lot more real. And we can't just have the favorite color, uh, our favorite color in common. We got to really be able to connect and be there for one another and have conversations and figure out how to help each other through times of trouble and times of trauma. We got to really, and that's another thing that bonds people so often. You, you've been through that. You've been through this. You've had to, friends turn on you and, you know, people seem like they love you in public, but they really hated you in private and, all this other kind of stuff, man, you know what that's like. We're going to fight against this together. Well, you better hope that y'all both agree on that. And one person isn't going to use that to their, uh, to their advantage. And they're going to be fighting against you. Now it's you versus the world and your spouse. Like, damn, you just became another burden. I thought we was going to fight back to back. That ain't what it turns out to be. Somebody get injured. Let somebody get into a car accident. Break their back. Can't walk for six months. Can't even, maybe can't even move. For six months, and you better hope it's only for six months. Guess what? You ever change a diaper? That ain't no joke. You ever change a diaper? Look at your spouse. You ready to change diapers? The Most High could touch either one of us at any given time for, for a number of reasons. Could be for a testimony like with Tovid. Could be for judgment. You ready to do that? You know, when people say they vows in the, in the world, they say in sickness and in health. 
The sickness ain't always got to be the, the hallmark movie, perfect health. You know, the person is like damn near not sick. They laying in bed all the time, but they're perfectly functioning. They can get up and go to the bathroom. You only see them in a couple of scenes, and they're oftentimes going to sleep. That's pretty simple sickness to kind of deal with outside of the tragedy of seeing someone that you love sick. What if they lose control of their bowels? That's hard. What if they can't walk? That's hard. What if they can't get to the shower on their own? That's hard. It's, it, man, there's so many number of things that I feel like we don't oftentimes consider when we're choosing our spouses and with our spouses up until it happens. And then it's like, oh, my God, am I really willing to do this? Am, have I really considered how far this could go? That's why he said, you get a woman that's like you because you know what you're capable of and you know what you're willing to do. You find someone that's willing to reciprocate that. He said, don't forsake her. Don't forsake him. He might have his issues. She might have her issues. If they're not against the laws of the most high, and it's very different from someone who's really striving and genuinely trying versus someone who just don't care. You got somebody that wants to try like you're trying, someone that wants to forgive like you forgive, somebody that wants to push like you push, someone that's about as close to equally yoked as you can get. He said, don't forsake them. He said, but don't give yourself to a light woman. What that mean? You can't have a red bone? That, that was the one, the, the light-skinned women? <laughs> yeah. The right. red bones? You can't love a light-skinned woman? No, that's not what he's saying. A light woman is a woman that she's going to be focused on minuscule things. She's not going to be there to comfort you. Scriptures say a woman that won't comfort her husband makes uh, heavy hands and feeble knees. That, that, that means so many different things. He's probably praying all the time on his knees, down on his hands, praying. He could also have no strength because his mind is just so distraught he can't focus on the work that he's doing. So many different things that that could mean. But uh, you know what's like, y'all seen how, like, a am going to say maybe a year ago, everybody was debating, and it was really amongst women, who gets the front seat. You remember that? <laughs> Bro, that was yeah. like, that was the most ridiculous conversation. And it was like everywhere you went on whatever platform, that conversation was being had, and it was like a real issue. The whole time, I'm like, bro, this is so irrelevant. You got pimps. And, man, I, t- I'm, I kid you not. We going to leave out of here tonight and go down there to the freeway, and I guarantee you we'll pro- we're, we're like 99% sure you're going to see a prostitute. We have real issues in our nation, real things that really need to be dealt with, terrible music that's being produced. Only black movies you see is, is us being portrayed as thugs and pimps, terrible mothers. We just selling. We, black people are in the business of trauma. That's what sells amongst us. We got, you know, no wealth, no generational, no generational, nothing to pass down outside of curses. We got all these different things going on, and, every, and, and everybody took it upon themselves to debate about who gets the front seat. And it's, and it's, so, and, and it's crazy, because that was so stupid to me, because I'm like, okay, I'm tall. My thing is, I don't care if it's mother or wife, who's taller? <laughs> the front seat, now, that, you know what that is? That's a child who got who was made to be a child, desperate for some level of a power for power or authority, feeling like that was gonna solve all their problems. Wait till I get grown, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this. They're starting to make a mess of their lives with this now newfound liberty, and now they're doing minuscule things and, and focused and caught up in the minutia because that's what makes you feel like an adult. Well, I want the front seat. Are you like, bro, if I gotta and, here's, and this is just this simple, and I'm not going to speak on it any further than that because I'm not about to get wrapped up in this. But, like, <laughs> if I got a wife that's 6'8", and my mama is 5'5", five five, mama, get in the back seat. If you got this gargantuan woman that needs this leg room, why would she get in the back seat? You going to scoot all the way? Just let her get the front seat. She needs the leg room. It's that simple. But everybody was so occupied. Everybody was so fascinated, and all these women was arguing and stating their opinions and going live and period. And I'm like, oh, my God, a whole lot of light women. That's why the most I said, don't give yourself over to a light woman. Talk about those things. Like, that's not fascinating. That's not interesting to me. That's not going to keep my attention. That's probably going to irritate me. I'm not going to want to talk about that for long at all. A bunch of things. It's not going to be entertaining, not going to be uh, 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 stimulating. It's going to be irritating. I don't want to talk about those things for long. The Most High said, do yourself a favor and don't give yourself over to a woman like that. 
Don't give yourself over to a woman that that's what she finds fascinating and that's where she wants to spend her time. House not clean. Issues in the marriage that she don't want to talk about. Things that really need to be done and she on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram watching the who gets the front seat debate. Now, if that's one of her off moments, then man, man you still got some hope. But if that's all she want to do, I might be a light woman. Uh, go over to First Timothy chapter chapter two. Chapter two, and uh, we're gonna start at verse twelve. The book of First Timothy chapter two, verse twelve. Uh huh. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to insert authority over the man. But to be in silence. So a woman is not, not, well, now she could teach other women and the children. We have those things. But she's not supposed to be usurping authority, taking authority from the men. Uh, but she's supposed to be in silence. Go ahead. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Uh -huh. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. He said, but the woman being deceived was the one that was in transgression. Adam wasn't deceived. Adam was first formed. He said the woman was deceived. She was the one who was initially in transgressions. Let's get uh, last last scriptures. First Corinthians chapter eleven and verse eight. The book of First Corinthians chapter eleven and verse eight. Uh -huh. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. That's important, sister. Stop getting so caught up. First and foremost. I'll just say this, um, and, and this will be as I speak, not, not you know, as the most high, as, as Paul said. Oftentimes, I feel like when we get into a relationship, we're looking for what we can get out of that relationship. And maybe for a man who's trying to build, that's a little bit more how he has to be geared into getting a woman who's going to be an asset, not a liability, to help him build his kingdom. But especially as a woman, the women, our foremothers, they was not looking for what they can get out of the man. They was looking for what they can bring to the table. I believe Sarah, when she met, uh, no, 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 Isaac, uh, Jacob, nope, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. Um. I be, but you know what, I think it was Isaac or Rebecca. It was either Abraham or, uh, or Isaac. But basically, when his wife met him, she got off the, the, the ass that she was on. She got off the donkey. I believe she covered herself with a veil. You, you want to say Sarah? I, I want to say, um, it was Sarah? Rebecca. 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 Okay, Kyle, it was oh. Rebecca. She was already in humility. What do you need? How can I help you? Uh, oh, man. Man, this is bad. Who was it? Was it? Okay, one more. It, uh, was it Isaac, I believe? After his mother died, Sarah took him into the tent. Rebecca. Tip. Rebecca. That was also Rebecca. Okay, that was, both of those was Rebecca, right? She took him into the tent to comfort him. Keep it real. They wasn't in the tent <laughs> playing Jenga. She knew what a man needed. She said, I can give him this. I can provide this for him. I know the space that he's in. I know that this may not fix everything for him, but for what the things that he's experiencing and the pain that he's in, having someone in his corner to talk to, to love him, to embrace him, and to give him that relief, that's something that he needs right now. She was willing to give to whatever, the, the, to whatever it is that, that her husband needed. Uh, Rachel and Leah, they couldn't have any more children for Jacob just for the time being. They was like, look, I, take one of my handmaids. I just want to see you win. I want to see you have more kids. I want to see you build a bigger legacy. I want to see you advance. Really, a woman is supposed to be in that mindset. So often women are looking at, oh, he's so tall. He's so handsome. I say it like this. I didn't choose to be tall. I didn't choose to be handsome. I don't know any man that did. That's not where a man puts his time and his, and his effort. That's not what he's building up. The wisdom, appreciate him for his wisdom, appreciate him for his advice. And watch if you appreciate that, how much more he's going to love you for it. Because we're built in, in uh, what do you call that, in the Most High's image. Look how the Most High gets down. That gives you, a man, a man is a glimpse of the Most High. We're not exactly like him. Even he says the, the wisdom of man is foolishness to the Most High, but we're very similar. We're jealous. Our rage will become out of our jealousy. We are calculated. We try to be. A wise man is going to be. Um, but another thing is, look how frustrated the Most High becomes with Israel because Israel doesn't take his advice. He said, you would none of my counsels and none of my reproof. He was like, all right, well, then I'm going to let you do you and let's see what happens to you. Don't a man be in that same position? 
Should I do this or should I do that? Ah, that ain't going to be a good move. You should do this. Ah, she going to do it anyway. It kind of irritates you. Like, if you're going to make your own decisions, don't even come talk to me. But if a woman appreciates a man for who he is and the wisdom he has, the authority that he holds, he's going to love her that much more for it. So he said, the woman was not formed for the man. The, uh, excuse me. The man was not formed for the woman. That's the American mindset. That's the, what does he bring you? He ain't getting my nails dead, my hair dead, and paying my bills. and No, don't, don't fall into that mentality because that's a disgusting mentality. Yes, of course, a man has to be able to provide. But that's not limited to finances. And I know it's not limited to finances because I'll ask you this. If a man is providing for you financially, your rent is paid, he give you some basics. Maybe even you get a little bit of the nice things. You got your iPhone 13. You got a pair of Hirachis, a pair of Jordan. You got some nice stuff, right? But you don't see him, not because he actually is doing something, but because he just really don't feel like spending time with you. How satisfied are you in that marriage? You got spiritual and scriptural questions. He, he's not in a position to answer them. He don't know how to answer them, or he's not willing to answer them. How, like, how does that make you feel? It, ain't, it can't be just financially, but that's so often what we get caught up on and what women are told to focus on. Find you a wise man, a righteous man. Watch how the most I increase him. I don't see Jacob um, like hustling and scrounging and scraping for money, but the most I gave him wealth. I didn't see Abraham do it. I didn't see Job do it. I didn't see David do it. I didn't see Solomon do it. But look how the most High elevated them and gave them all those other things because he was a righteous man. That's what you should be looking for. Look at Tobit. He lost his sight for what, 14 years? His wife had to go out and had to find woman's work. She had to figure it out and help him and maintain. That's, what a, that's the mindset that you should be in when you get with this spouse. If he go down, I'm going to hold it down for him. If she goes down, I'm going to make sure she's taken care of. It's team us. Because when you have that and you have a strong household, you have a strong brick in the nation. You have a strong household. Because look at a lot of the, the things that are in the scriptures. They were households. Christ came out of a righteous household. Uh, David and Solomon out of the same household. Look at the, the Maccabees, the same household. The woman and the second son, uh, excuse me, and the seven sons who died out of the same household. Um, I mean, there's countless examples of just these households. Sometimes that's all it really takes. Try to help build up your household. Don't be Eve. Don't be like Eve. Figure those things out. Separate, you know, the, the, the things that are important versus the minutia. Overcome that within yourself and figure out what it is that you need to be doing and should be doing to uplift your husband, to uplift the nation, and to be a better help, to be pleasing unto the most high. Matthew 6 and 33, if you seek the most high in his righteousness, all these other things are going to be added unto you. Do you have anything you want to bring out? Doc? No, I'm good, Doc. All right, Israel, well, we appreciate you for tuning in. Uh, please like and share the video to help spread the gospel. I hope that this was edifying um, and that it was useful, that it was beneficial. Um, please continue to tune in with us. You know, we have a number of, of different classes that we host throughout the week with various different topics um, and different purposes. So please continue to tune in with us. And with that, we say Shalom. Shalom. And y'all know what it is. Another Wooly Main production. Try first light, right before the sunset. Beheld with my own eyes. Ah, but what a blessing! It's a, it's a new moon. The first crescent. We gon' share some mirth and some gladness. Ain't nobody stressing. Look, I was too focused on the ways of men. Had to refocus, turn my ways to him Let's get it right, we ain't afraid of men The kingdom is the goal and yes, we aim to win Our fathers watch to see the month begin There must be light to see what's groping, trying to make it in Father, forgive us for this sin, cause we didn't know no better Glad our fathers kept a record, this cannot be severed Not the conjunction or the fool, it was in those letters Not one jot, no one tittle by the law, we fed it We'll probably get the kingdom faster if we work together Glorified and it will never We celebrate Yo, Big Bob The real yeah. Yo, what we celebrate
And I want to take the opportunity right now to say all praise be to Yahweh, Bahashah, Pamashiach, Yahweh Shah. I'm going to say that one more time. All praise be to Yahweh, Bahashah, Pamashiach, Yahweh Shah. The spirit of one of my dear brothers, Zabak, I want to say, Kai! And we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Check 